Here we go. Session 18. Okay. Today we are going to talk about well, a whole bunch of stuff. We're going to cover basically the seventh century. That is to say, the 600s, most of them. Um, but we'll be focusing especially on the Persians, uh, the Muslims, and the Sixth Ecumenical Council. So here we go. In 570, Muhammad was born in Mecca, and he was rejected there, so he left and went somewhere else where, unfortunately, he was not rejected. <laughs> and we'll get to that. He was the founder of Islam. Um, which uh, basically believes that Christ was <coughs> born of the Virgin Mary, but a prophet and one of the apostles. And Muhammad said that he was the last prophet. Just for a point of reference, Mecca is for present day. Mecca. It's Saudi Arabia. It's yeah. Saudi Arabia. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That would have been. Yeah, it's where the Kaaba. It's where the Borg cube is. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's spreading. <laughs> it is. It's just as well assimilate, right? <laughs> right, right. Pagans <laughs> dancing around okay. this food rock. <laughs> well, you remember, hopefully, from last time, that. <laughs> The Persians had long been at battle with the empire and had for many, many years persecuted Christians. The Persian religion is called Zoroastrianism. That's a mouthful. <clears throat> but in 582, the Eastern Emperor Maurice formed a friendship with the Persian king Khosrows II. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right, but anyway, that was spelled right. <clears throat> and uh, Khosrows married Emperor Maurice's daughter, and that friendship grew in strength to the extent that King Khosrows considered Emperor Maurice his father. Mm. So there was peace starting in 582 between the Empire, the Eastern Empire, and the Persian Kingdom. Unusual. But in 602, uh, in the Eastern Empire, a man named Phocas murdered the emperor and made himself the new emperor. We won't get into his life, but he was a terrible individual and emperor. He was so terrible that just a few years later, um, the Persians attacked Constantinople. And the war resumed for 18 years. It's important now as we go through this to <coughs> mentally divide or realize that the Persians are not the Muslims. Because basically they fairly quickly in this century do a lot of the same things. 
Where, the Persians first and then the Muslims. Where, where's so, the Persian capital? Where Would it be, is it Iran today? Is that where Persia would be? Or? Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to think of the name of the capital, but it's not Tehran. No, it's actually it's actually pretty close. The original capital is actually pretty close to Tehran. I looked it up once on Wikipedia. <laughs> but in uh, 613, and, and they did not take Constantinople, by the way. Constantinople, you recall from their map, was pretty well fortified. <clears throat> so, so in 613, they took Antioch and Damascus, which is to say the Persians took Syria. Mm -hmm. And then in 614, they took Jerusalem, which is to say they took Palestine. Mm -hmm. And then in 619, they took Egypt. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and we'll get back to that. In 622, Muhammad was in Medina. That's where he went. And um, it's believed that at, at this time he had uh, about 10,000 followers. Um, in the same year, the Persians, uh, helped by the Slavs uh, from north, uh, attack Constantinople again. Uh, that attack failed and um, there was a great celebration in Constantinople and um, the failure of the attack, as had happened before, uh, was attributed in Constantinople to the protection uh, by the Theotokos. And yesterday, yesterday was the feast of the protection of the Theotokos. Right. And the ir the irony in that is it, it is celebrated in the Greek churches. But it's not that big of a celebration. But in the Russian church, it's a very large feast day. <laughs> and they were the ones yeah. who lost. <laughs> they were the ones attacking and getting repelled. I was... Right, I always think that's kind of funny. They're devout people. You gotta love the <coughs> Slavs. They are great. So, in... 627, a general by the name of Heraclius, 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 uh, from the Eastern Empire, uh, invaded Persia. And it took him about one year to conquer their imperial city, their capital, and uh, he completely defeated the Persians. I assume by this time, Focus is long gone, dead. Soon. Okay. Um, because he's on the channel. <coughs> um, actually, um, well, I think it was emperor by the time he took the Holy Cross. So um, he was proclaimed emperor uh, basically because he did this. And I think Focus was executed. Anyway, he was done away with. The Persians had taken the Holy Cross from Jerusalem to their country, their capital. And so Heraclius, Heraclius took it back. I believe that's when he carried it on his shoulders um, as 
In 629, we see the beginning of a heresy called monothelitism. Can you see that there? Yeah. I didn't how it's spelled. It was an attempt to compromise between the Chalcedonians and the Monophysites. Another one. And it said, while Christ has two natures, he has no human will, just a divine will. We've actually heard that before. But there were quite a few supporters. Um, Theodore of Arabia, uh, Athanasius of Antioch, these are bishops, Cyrus of Alexandria, Sergius of Constantinople, and last but not least, perhaps most, Emperor Heraclius. Christ has two natures, but he has no human will, just divine will. That's what they said. In hopes that the two sides could come together. We'll come back to that. We're going kind of chronologically, so we don't jump around. In 632, three years later, Muhammad goes back and conquers Mecca. And by this time, Islam is growing rapidly. One year later, Emperor Heraclius for forms, uh, puts together a pro- monothelite agreement. And the Monophysites, because of that, the Monophysites and the Chalcedonians in Egypt start communing. where the similarity with the Persians get, comes. And one year later, in 634, the Muslims take Syria and Palestine. They take Jerusalem in 638. There's a long siege to take Jerusalem, and the patriarch in Jerusalem at that time was uh, named Sophonius. And patriarch Sophonius had the Holy Cross, which had been returned, uh, sequestered and taken to Constantinople. But, but because, well, immediately after he did that, he surrendered to the Muslims. Um, we've heard about caliphates recently. The caliph that took a lot of these countries, and especially to Jerusalem, was Caliph Umar. There was an agreement of surrender.
And these were the, uh, some of the terms, the major terms of surrender of Jerusalem by Patriarch Sophronius to Muslim King <coughs> Umar. And the agreement said that churches and property of Christians will be preserved if There's no evidence of Christian faith in the streets. There's no prevention of conversion to Islam. If Christians are submissive and loyal to Muslims, Well, churches and property were not preserved, but this agreement set the stage or kind of a pattern for Muslim domination for Christian survival under that uh, domination. So they had already pretty much come up with all the doctrines of Demihood at this time. Every, everything, well, everything today that it means to be a demi and pay the jizya and live under Islam as a non-Muslim seems to be there. Well, there are already more, there are more things that come. Okay, but we'll look at some of those. So that's where the term caliphate comes from, from him. Uh, no, no, no. That's uh, a term of, um, it's like emperor. Term of rank. Right, or term of rank. It's kind of like king. More like holy king. There's there's an element of Islamic holiness. There there's an element of being you know uh, ruling in the name of Islam. It's not just not just kingship, but there's a faith component to it. So a few years later, while the Muslims are doing all that, a few years later. Uh, Emperor Heraclius actually publishes a document called the Exposition of Faith. And that was a pro monothelite document. In general, the East accepted it and the West rejected or, or, or protested it. From 639 to 646, and you recall there were both Chalcedonians and Monophysites in Egypt, <coughs> and because of this uh, development, they actually they began communing. Um, so there were Chalcedonian bishops in Egypt. <coughs> but in, in, in this period, the Muslims took Egypt. Then they installed the Monophysites. So I guess you could send away because of this, Egypt is non Chalcedonian today. In 641, Heraclius died and named his 11-year-old grandson, Constans II, as his replacement, Emperor Constans II. <clears throat> 
Seven years later, Pope Martin of Rome formally condemns monothelitism. And in the East, there was, it was a monk, right? Uh, Archimandrite, Maximus the Confessor was his name. And he was probably the only significant theologian of this century. And he also opposed monothelitism. And both Pope Martin and Maximus Confessor were taken to Constantinople and tried and imprisoned, tortured, and ultimately died. One historian has called this, quote, the low point in the moral fiber of the Eastern Church, unquote. Um, I'll leave it up to you as we go on, just in a few years, to decide whether or not it might have actually gotten a little lower. In 662, so he wasn't too old, uh, Constance II was murdered in Sicily, <coughs> and his son, Constantine V, became the emperor. say about Constantine the fifth. Not much. <laughs> In six sixty eight, Pope Vitalian of Rome appointed the first Archbishop of Canterbury. of monothelitism, the Sixth Ecumenical Council was called. Uh, it, well, it occurred in Constantinople uh, in 680 and part of 681. Attendance was pretty low, uh, particularly in comparison to one that we looked at not long ago that had over 500 bishops. And there was not very much representation from the East because of the Muslim conflict. conflict. And by now, communication between Constantinople and Rome had become very difficult because of the Muslim. Expansion. This council really focused a lot of their discussions on the traditions of the church. It was kind of not physically led by because he had reposed, but it was the council was inspired by the theology of this Maximus the Confessor. And, and Maximus was not an Archimandrite. He was not. No, he was a monk. He was not ordained. Oh, okay. He was a simple monk, not a priest. But quite a theologian. Oh one of the greatest in the church.
Patriarchs George of Constantinople and Macarius of Antioch at the council were initially uh, supportive in favor of monothelitism. But during the council, Patriarch George of Constantinople switched his allegiance to the Chalcedonians. And that kind of changed the tone of things. Um, I would imagine that because of this, and as the council proceeded, um, it was probably apparent that things were kind of swinging more in the Chalcedonian direction and against monothelitism. So, there was a priest at the council by the name of Polychronius, and he said, Um, let's put my monothelite confession of faith on um, the body of a dead man. And that dead man will rise um, to life because of the rightness of monothelitism. So the council said, good idea, let's do it. Great deal, let's try it. <laughs> Polychronius, you'll be the dead man. No, <laughs> they did not say yeah. that. Well, they brought one in. Uh, <laughs> just anyway. They put his confession of faith on the man, and they waited. That's the 680, 681. <laughs> oh. Nice. Nice. That's a long time to have a council a whole year. And they waited. <laughs> and they waited. And he did not rise. So, the council said that monothelitism <laughs> and the former popes, Sergius of Constantinople, Honorius of Rome, <clears throat> and the Emperor Heraclius are condemned. That's important because it shows, I think, that the ancient church considered that every bishop, including popes, and as a matter of fact, emperors, are supposed to submit to the authority of the councils of the church. And you have a pope speaking I don't know if he spoke ex cathedra, but supporting a heresy. Right. And this is the teaching office of Peter, you know, this is the rock on which the church is founded. And a ecumenical council that is accepted, I think the later was edited because, you know, they didn't want to accept that part that Honorius is condemned, but is accepted by East and West the condemnation of a Pope of Rome as a heretic. Significant. Uh, to ultimately kind of demonstrate a point. Shortly after the council was over, uh, the leader of a monastery close to Antioch, whose name was John Maron, mm. Mm. <laughs> maintained that Christ 
maintained the monothole position and took uh, his followers to the mountains of Lebanon and, and separated from the church. And they became known as Maronites. Obviously, from his name. Why do I mention that? Well, in 1184, so we have to really jump forward. The Maronites submitted themselves to the authority of the Roman Church. So they became, they came under the authority of the Roman Catholic Church. <clears throat> as we have talked, and the reason I'm mentioning this is as we have talked, and as it will become more and more the case as we approach the schism, and go past it even, we'll talk sometimes about the Eastern Church, that is the Orthodox Church, which was in the East, and you kind of understand geographically where it was. We'll talk sometimes about the Roman Church, which is the Roman, becomes the Roman Catholic Church, and that's in Rome, and, and what we call kind of the West. But it's not really all as simple as that, because there were uh, basically Catholic churches in the East and there were Orthodox churches in the West. But that's the Maronites. By now, there had been um, years of conflict with Islam, uh, continued degradation of the fiber of the empire, the Roman Empire, certainly attacks upon the Eastern Empire. <coughs> Um, and there had been a pretty consistent in, uh, increase in barbarism, uh, low morality. Um, a general deg degradation <coughs> of moral thought and action along with the degradation of the economy and the armies and all the other things. Well, inside and outside the church. So, in 692, Emperor Justinian II called a council uh, in Trudeau. It's referred to as the Trulin Council. And it's my words here, or my thought, not anybody else's, but it seems to me that this was basically an attempt to legislate morality. Mm. I believe there were... Well, the, the fifth and sixth ecumenical councils had very few or no canons attached to them like the other councils. So Trullo, which is also called the Quintusex Council, is considered a part of the Sixth Ecumenical Council uh, because it, though it meant afterwards, it provides canons, which are not just, not just morality, but good order, discipline among the church, different things. Uh, in fact, they 
promulgated 102 canons at this council. So I'm not listing them all, but here's an example of some of them. We said that pre not, priests cannot own hotels, lend money, or gamble. I'm not sure what priests got into owning hotels anyway, but... Monks cannot leave monasteries, or we've heard that before. They cannot spend the night under a roof where a woman is present, and they cannot celebrate their tonsure. You know what tonsure is. Okay. Priests and deacons <coughs> are married. Remember that. The council uh, said that the Roman church is condemned for enforcing sexual abstinence on its married clergy. So here we're beginning to see a bifurcation, a division. They said that the Western practice of fasting on Saturdays and Sundays of Great Lent is condemned. More separation. They said that the Western practice of using a lamb as a symbol of Christ is rejected. Like in iconography. Right. This council, I'm briefly describing because it, it's very significant. And it is, in fact, significant because its decisions, some of them listed here, show a, a division or a separation in what's acceptable and what's not within the church between the Eastern and the Western churches. The beginning, really not the beginning because we've mentioned it before, way, way back to Oregon and whatever, mm -hmm. but more evidence of a separation of the Western and Eastern churches. Still, 400 years before the actual split, the schism. To me, that's why the Tulip Council is worth mentioning. Yeah, it shows that. Uh, just to point out one thing. One, it's kind of ironic that if you look at how much things have not changed in the East, but changed in the West, that the East is condemning the practice of fasting on Saturdays and Sundays in the West. And there's no fasting in the West anymore, basically, for all intents and purposes. There's like fish Fridays, and you know you have to fast an hour before you go to communion. Um, but uh, I want to make clear on this, by fasting, they, there's two things in fasting. There's fasting, which is amount, and abstinence, which is kind of food. If you notice... In the Orthodox Church, Wednesday, uh, Saturdays and Sundays, there's always fish, fish and oil, or uh, not fish and oil, excuse me, wine and oil. And that corresponds to eating a normal amount of food. Even during a fasting period, we're not going to, uh, on weekends, eat cheese and meat and all that stuff, but we will eat a normal amount of food, but when we get back to the weekdays, whether it's practiced by the faithful today or not, the idea then and still is you eat less. So what this is saying is not that the East has changed and now, hey, wait a minute, we fast during Saturdays and Sundays now. We do, but we still lighten the fast by allowing wine and oil and eating more. So this is condemning or having a problem with the fact that even on Saturdays and Sundays, which are the day of rest, the day of resurrection, in the West at this time, apparently, 
they're saying you have to keep the fast, which is, you know, like one meal after the ninth hour. So I just want to, is that clear? Mm -hmm. Okay. So by the late 600s, this century we're studying. Uh, the empire is breaking up. Islam is a predominant force and expanding. And that brought an emphasis on synods or meetings of bishops. And especially upon the centrality, the control of the one unoccupied patriarchate. What patriarchate is not yet occupied? Constantinople. Another reason that we talked, uh, you mentioned this last time, but another reason that the patriarch of Constantinople has <coughs> come to be seen as the ecumenical or universal patriarch. I thought we'd close by taking a look, a brief look, at Islam and Sharia law as it came out of the 7th century. And it gets back to an earlier slide, the Jerusalem Agreement, terms of surrender, and what Bill was talking about. It says that Christian males can be conscripted and forced to accept Islam, that is, conscript, conscripted into the military, the Muslim army. They were generally put in front. Christians cannot hold a public office or have authority over Muslims. This means that in Muslim controlled societies, there are lots of kinds of jobs that Christians simply cannot have. Christians cannot testify against Muslims in a Muslim court of law. A Muslim who commits a crime against a Christian receives half the punishment had it been against a Muslim. Christians are really second-class citizens at best. Muslims who convert to Christianity must be executed. That's no new news to us. And Christians must pay a special tax. As we go forward, the degree to which there is tolerance or intolerance of Christians by Muslims kind of changes. This kind of thing, and what we said earlier, we could call the tolerant position. And there are times when it becomes much less tolerant, more intolerant. Persecution, executions, forced conversions. Uh, examples are here, 
and it even varies within these examples from caliph to caliph, but from 661 to 750, about where we are, uh, to 750, so it's only, it's not very many years there, there were a series of what are called only a caliphates, and they were tolerant, if you want to call it tolerant. <laughs> After that, there was a whole series of Abbasid caliphates from 750 to 1258. So here we're talking a much longer period of time. And they were, in general, intolerant of Christians. That's the end.